Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA, and this is week 10. This is our week 10 live interactive webcast. There's only one more. It's kind of week 11. It's Monday. As soon as ModPo 2019 Symposium Mode is done, we will be back at 10.30 a.m. on Monday. Calling all ModPo webcast attendees far and wide. Book your flights. Get on your trains. Fuel up the cars. Put on the hiking boots. For those of you in Trenton and haven't done that day trip lately, <laughs> <laughs> please join us at 10.30 a.m. on Monday for Final Words. Final Words webcasts are great because... There's no agenda. It's all final words. Each of us will have a chance at the table and in the hangouts and in the audience here to, do a, to offer a final word. You'll call in to 610-616-3208, 610-616-3208, and you'll offer your final words. And I will also send this out to everyone. We also have a voicemail line, ModPo voicemail, and you can call, you can call ModPo voicemail and leave us a final word, which we, if we have time, we'll play, we'll play on the air. So that's final words. But today, it's week 10, and we have a special, 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 special <laughs> really special. super special guest. We love her so much, and also we honor her sheer talent and bravery. She's always getting herself in some dangerous, like, limb being sawn off by herself behind her uh, tightrope walking, uh, you know, conceit, paint, conceit running out of control, painting herself into a corner thing that she does in her performance pieces, in all of her art, and that is the divine Tracy Morris. She's Yay! here. Wow. Oh, Tracy. Thank you so much for making the trip from Iowa yeah. to be with us. Hi. Hi. Hey. Thanks. So <laughs> we're going to have a chance to talk with Tracy today. If you call 610-616-320, you can ask 3208. You can ask Tracy a question. We actually have a question we're going to start with in a minute after my announcements uh, uh, that Clarissa Stein from Australia has posted, and she's not able to... Um, make the live webcast because what time is it there? It's about four in the morning, four or five in the morning probably in Australia. So, but Clarissa sent in her question. But meantime, there's Lily. Hi, Lily. Hey, Al. Hey, Jess. Hey, Al. Hi. Hi. This was fun prepping this week, wasn't it? Oh yeah. 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 Much fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. Amber Rose Johnson. Hi, I got to see you perform last night in New York at our Writers House event, and you're amazing. Ooh, Not thanks. that I had forgotten it, but I was reminded. <laughs> Anna Strong Safford. Hey. Hello. Hey, Davy. <laughs> What's up, Al? Can you bring Davy's mic up because you got You got to hear him. He's got such a great voice. Let's start over. Hi, Davy. <laughs> What's up, Al? That's a little better, Chris. <laughs> Gabe, Chicago, what's question. the temperature out there, Gabe? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, we got a bad connection, Gabe. See if you can, like, w should I suggest that he just sign on again? Or get a new, get a new, uh, get a new computer, get a, get a new, uh, you know, whatever. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, he's off uh -oh. and on again. Erica, hi. Hi, Al. Hey. Oh, you two are a little in and out. And Dave Poplar in Arizona. Hey. Good afternoon. Hey, oh, you're good. Oh, and Gabe is clear. back. Let's try it again, Gabe. Is this any better? Yes. yes. Okay, Aww. hi. Yeah, hey. <laughs> so what was the temperature? I was saying I think it's just above 20 degrees. Oh, boy. And Max is in the same city, but... He's probably on the south side. No, you're on the... No, Gabe's not on the south side. Where are you, we Max? We are and we are both in Andersonville. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Max, how you doing? I'm good. The temperature is probably the same throughout the entire week. Okay. You know, Max is, Max is causing all kinds of havoc, too. I think it might be on your end, Max. There's something staticky and unpluggy, and I don't know. Those are my, that's my professional description of what's happening. <laughs> okay, we also have Jason. Hey, Jason. And we have some friends here. This is so great. We have Emily, who is an FOT, friend of Tracy, fan of Tracy. <laughs> I wish I was a friend of Tracy. Yeah, well, you can be now. You can be now. <laughs> yep. And we have Andrew, who's a neighbor of mine, who's also a, a COT, collaborator of Tracy. Yes, the legendary. 
Yeah, and I hope we hope we will get a mic to you at some point. And um, we have Pam's here, so welcome back. Hi, and for the first time, I believe, in the Arts Cafe ever, ever, ever in many years of being associated with Modpo, we have the amazing MC. And do we say Katniss? Yeah. MC Katniss is here. Yay. Fabulous CTA, and it's so great it's to so see awesome. you. And. Zach, close up. <laughs> Eat your hearts out, people. <laughs> we have some biscotti. It's got all kinds of yummy things in it, including mandana, including pistachio. 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 Oh, and it reminds me, we, we have mandana here from New York, and she was here for uh, an earlier discussion we had with Tracy. And we have Claire Adams, our first ever and onlyest, mod <laughs> onlyest mod po intern. Claire, we love you. Thank you. All right, couple of announcements. I mentioned the final words webcast. Um, another announcement is that we have in Modpo Plus a new Rosemary Waltrup, Waldrop uh, video. It's about her piece Memory Tree, which is about the first day of school in Germany in 1941. Um, and it is quite a piece, and it's a really great discussion that we did as a Poem Talk episode. hope you'll take a look at it. Um, one more kind of shout out, this is to John Stark, and then I'm gonna pose Clarissa's question to Tracy. So John Stark, so he is in Arizona. Dave, you guys should get a meetup together. <laughs> um, so he got really excited uh, about uh, Tracy's performance that we have of African, African uh, that we have on our site that we use. And it was done at the University of Arizona's Poetry Center, I believe, at a conference on, I don't know, conceptualism and the future or something like that. It's like conf conceptualism's plural and plus. And, um, and so he got very excited and he went over to the Arizona Poetry Center. But he found the doors locked. And he wanted to explore the center and read more Frank O'Hara. Tonight I'm studying Mod Po and watch Tracy Morris read at the very same Poetry Center, May 2008, an improbable coincidence. I especially loved her poem for Allen Ginsberg, who all of us knew, who I knew, says John Stark. The locked door of the Poetry Center mirrors my relationship with the Academy. Entrances barred with stuffiness, intimidation, bureaucracy, and impossible to navigate campuses. Thank you, Mod Po, for throwing open the doors. Aww. Thank you, John. Thank you for that incredible compliment. All right, we're going to start. It's a question for Tracy, um, but I would like Tracy as well as Jess and Gabe to respond to it. Uh, Clarissa from Australia. Tracy, the audio performance, video performance, and musical performance of Africa or African affected me differently, meaning one different from the other. From audio physically hurting me to video being absolutely amazing, seeing you working your voice, to recognizing the rhythm of repetitive work as I was listening to the musical performance. What, Tracy, if I may ask, are your own relationships to the, those differing performances? Partly it's also media, audio recording as opposed to video. Um, and I'll add one more question she's got here. Um, during the video performance, I found it interesting how the focus on the beginning of the sentence, it all started when, despite it being repeated over and over again, slowly but persistently changed to a focus on the word slaves. Um, over the course of you working with this sentence, Tracy, uh, am I assuming rightly that it took on a much wider meaning than you may have originally imagined or envisaged? It's a question that's been asked here of you before, but I appreciate that Clarissa hasn't been part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So um, love to hear you on it. And then uh, Jess and Gabe after that. It looks hey, like we have hey some. Hey, Al, we actually have Clarissa on the phone. Oh, whoa! Ooh. If you want me to put Clarissa <laughs> through. Now that is so wow. fucking weird. How You were supposed to be asleep, Clarissa. <laughs> <laughs> Clarissa, I'm going to put you through right now, okay? <laughs> Clarissa? Hold on one second. Yeah. Hi, Clarissa. All right, let's do it. Hi, Clarissa. Hi, Elf. How are you? I'm good. It's very... W what time is it? Seven o'clock. Oh, wow. Not bad. Okay. Um, I just read your question to Tracy. She, <laughs> Tracy's right here. Can you see Tracy? <laughs> oh, it's a delay. 
Yes. I think you're on a delay. Chris Martin, can you figure that out? I am. Tona turned down her oh. computer on. I, Clarissa, turn down your computer and listen to me on your phone. Is she Skyping us or calling on the phone, Chris? All right. <laughs> That's what's happening. <laughs> Clarissa, hi. Hi. This is better, I'm isn't fine. it? I'm not asleep. I could manage to change what I had to do to, do to this morning, and so I'm here. And I'm very glad that I'm seeing you all again. That's and great. And Tracy, of course. That's oh, great. Hi. Well, Clarissa... I've read your question for Tracy out loud, so what I want you to do now is watch and listen as Tracy answers it, and then Jess and Gabe are going to take a turn, and then we'll ask you for your response. Okay? Does yeah, that sound okay. good? All right. What part so, of uh, Australia are you from, Clarissa? I'm from the central uh, west in Victoria. Oh, okay. Okay. I haven't been over there yet, but uh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Uh, there was a few, there are a few components to it, but I would firstly say that I don't consider, uh, that poem musical uh, or music. I can, it, it has musical elements, but it's not music. It's a poem. And because I sing, I, I compartmentalize different ways in which I use my voice, but, uh, Yes, I would say that that's one thing. And you said about it hurting you hearing it, uh, but you had a different experience seeing it. And since the audio is the same as the performance watching me perform it, I'm wondering w why or how it was physically affecting you differently. I'm curious about that. She's listening. Clarissa? Yes. It probably was because with the audio, um, there were many words which did not really come through. Mm. And, and it, it was a bit confusing listening it. Whereas when I saw um, Tracy reading, uh, then I could actually make out the words she was reading by looking at her, at her mouth and her lips. I think this is so interesting. I think this is interesting, period, because thank you for being interested. <laughs> but I also think it's interesting because the audio somehow emphasizes this thing that's embedded in, the, in sound poetry, which is disorientation. Mm -hmm. And I think disembodiment is heightened, heightens the disorientation. Mm -hmm. Whereas being able to not only see people m m mouth words but to see the intention of the facial expressions and all of that can be comforting to say okay this is an embodied practice with this person it's not just disorienting yeah but I want all of those elements to be in there differently depending on the media that it medium it's in and also sometimes at the same time irrespective of the medium yeah. so I, it's just thank you for that it's a very interesting answer um, Jess could you um either ter make a further comment or direct a further question toward Tracy about this? Sure, I think I, think I can um, add another layer to the, to the question. Um, picking up on the form of the sentence um, and taking into account what, what you just said, Tracy, which is that the poem is not, um, is not musical. And so I would, I would ask then, um, and I'm, I'm thinking back to Stein, and I know Stein is important to you. And I'm thinking about Stein's idea of saving the sentence. I don't know if you know mm. that, you know, the, in, in How to Write, there's an essay called Saving the Sentence. And I think, you know, um, part of what Stein means by saving the sentence is, okay, we have to like break the sentence apart mm. entirely in order to save it, right? Mm. The sentences that we know the sentences that we hear, the sentences that we know how to read or, or that we used to think, understand, whatever, they need to be completely broken apart. And that's why, gra you know, that's like the whole thing with grammar. That's mm -hmm. why it's so important. So, um, yeah, if I could direct the question, I guess, 
toward the, the unit of the sentence and how maybe you, you, you conceive of that in yeah. its breaking, you know, in, in, in breaking it apart. Yeah, I have no investment in a sentence in sound poetry, <laughs> <Okay>. zero. <laughs> okay. it's, 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 it's weird, it, it's poetry, it's not based on the sentence. Yeah. To a certain extent, it's based on a narrative arc. Uh, my sound poetry, unlike Schritter's, is very much committed to a narrative arc. Uh, but I think there's a freedom and an, an intensity and density that's allowed it in not being about the sentence. Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely moving away from the sentence. It doesn't mean that I don't think that you know, Stein's comment is valuable in terms of understanding how language works. Mm -hmm. But I think we are having, we're having different conversations in sound poetry about, what, about the sentence as a structure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even committed to words. So the sentence, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I wanted to turn to Gabe for a thought about this. Sure. Hi, just checking my connection is good for you all. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, in this week and in earlier points of this course, we've talked a lot about the tool of variation. So taking mm -hmm. uh, a unit of language that already exists and then just playing with it, uh, exacerbating it, or improvising off of it. That's the big thing this week, especially with the, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance pieces and things like that. Mm -hmm. So this is a good example of that, right? And I think this is where Jess's question comes from. But I think what Tracy's piece does really well is it brings back the role of the breath in speech um, and in speech acts. And you know, my experience of this piece is in like actually seeing it live. So I have a sort of different understanding or different relationship or intimacy with the role of the breath in it. But, you know, it, it, I would invite Tracy to to speak to this, but the, the kind of diaphragm work and the breath work there, it really just reminds you of the, the physical capacities of every sentence or every speech act that we make. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, well, it's, a sentence variation and line variation is a tool of the toolkit of the actor's performance, you know, different ways of adding variation and texture to lines, you know, as interpretive artists. And I think I started thinking about that, I know I started thinking about that before I seriously studied acting. Um, but you can't do that without having a relationship to the breath and accessing different parts of the vocal register in my case, or even just different parts of the texture of words themselves requires different types of breathing. So it's very much an issue. And you know, it's without going into a whole thing, just to say, a lot of breath work is reminding me of what we already know how to do with the body. Mm. It's just we have to work at forgetting it. But the body, you know, pretty much is invested in the breathing situation. <laughs> so how do we, we have to train ourselves out of what the body already knows how to do well. Mm. And uh, getting back to that is, is critical. And it might seem like I'm going a little bit far afield, but that has a lot to do with politics. <laughs> and the politics of shame of the body and wishing that the body didn't look the way it did because there's always this you know, festering dissatisfaction with one's corporeal self because we're advertised to, to feel embarrassed and ashamed no matter how we look. Mm -hmm. You can always do something else. And um, that actually affects breath control because we're always holding in or being feeling bad or focusing on muscularity versus the breathing apparatus and what the body knows how to do efficiently. So unlearning a lot of that stuff to get open, as they say in hip hop, is has been the big meditation and been able to do sound work. And it gets politicized when you, as Nate Mackey has done, associate breath with precarity. Right, I can't breathe. Yeah. I can breathe. Yeah, and so on. Um, Clarissa, are you still there? Yes. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. I'm I'm uh, very fascinated with what Tracy is saying. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad. What what uh, what interests you about it? 
Well, I have not. I haven't thought about this. That um, about this. What you're saying about the, being able to breathe through um, such a performance, and um, mm. that is interesting. And um, I would probably want to try this for myself because mm. sometimes I do have breathing problems. Oh, mm. Clarissa, mm. thank you so much for the call, and uh, I hope you have a great day. It being only seven a.m. the next day, <laughs> it's thir it's when it's Thursday there. Clarissa, thanks for being part of Mod Po. Okay, Take thank care. you. All right, great. Bye. Thank you. That's Clarissa six one zero six one six three two zero. You can also Skype us at Mod Po New Word Pen. Am I right, Chris? Mod Po Pen, as if Mod Po is the first name and Pen is. The second name. Let me make a list of the poems that we're talking about this week, and then I think uh, I would like to hear a couple of tweets if there are some fun ones, and then we'll mm. all sort of pick another piece and talk about it. Pass the mic around. We have Kenny Goldsmith's soliloquy, Act One, which is um, one side of a conversation that he had, and that would have been one day of the week, Act One, uh, transcribed. Christian Buck's Unoya. Uh, the chapter E, in which every word had to have an E in it only. Uh, that is, other letters, but it had to have an E. Erica Baum's, uh, Baum's card catalog and her dog ear, which we all love. Caroline Bergvall's Via. It's a bunch of translations of one tercet of Dante. Mike McGee's Pledge and Flarfist My Angie Dickinson. Uh, Rosemary Waldrop's N plus seven. Uh, David, what's N plus seven, quickly? Uh, a uh, procedure in which you um, uh, put a word in a poem by looking it up in the dictionary and going seven words ahead. Yeah. So uh, she wrote a, a shorter American memory of the Declaration of Independence in which she rewrote the Declaration of Independence, adding seven words down uh, in a dictionary. Jen Scapitone's Vase Poppies, which is a rewriting of HD. Nasser Hussein, brand new this year to the main syllabus. Sky Writings. Sky Writings which are poems using only three-letter uh, abbreviations of airport, airport codes, basically. And Tracy Morris, African in the main syllabus. We have uh, some Rod, in Mod Po Plus, Rod Smith. We have some traffic from Kenny Goldsmith. We have Yop Blanc, what the president will say and do. Uh, Lainey Brown's Daily Sonnets. Uh, another Rosemary Waldrop. Another Caroline Bergvall. And lots more Tracy Morris. And a new piece, Jen Scapitone's Republic of Exit 43. Mm. So, um, how, about, how about if I show you a page from, uh, from, dog, from ca Card Catalog by Erica Baum, and I've made a few copies for the table here, and I'll explain it to those in the Hangout. It's a, very, it's a fairly unusual one. And I'm going to ask Zach to focus in on this bad Xerox of it. <laughs> Not bad, Zach. I love what does it one. say, Anna? Explorers. Explorers. So it's, an, uh, it's a mm. car, card catalog, photograph, foreshortened, with a handwritten tab, librarian's tab, way at the back, and it says Explorers. I love this one. So, Anna, why don't you start? Let's go. Um, Anna, Davey, and Dave Poplar on this one, and then we'll see where we go from there. So one thing I love about it is the way that, um, unlike some of the other photographs, which use foreshortening to flatten the distance between the tabs that we see, um, in this photograph we actually have the drawer pulled out just slightly. Yeah. So it looks like we're kind of going into, like deep into the dark, deep, dark drawer. Yeah. With that explorers, which is like a great sort of visual pun. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I love about it is that it is like a handwritten tab where most of these are typed. Um, yeah. And it really does give that sense of uh, this is a, you know, a, there's a exploratory feel mm -hmm. to this. These are parts unknown. This is, mm -hmm. yeah, we're going into uncharted areas. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you that for that start. Davey, what's your thought on this? Um, I have... A, First of all, it's a poem. She, it, she thinks of it as a poem. It is a poem, and I think that the... The reason why I would um, 
identify this as a poem if I were pressed, let's say, by a student who said, this isn't a poem, what the heck? Um, it's a photograph, yes, and it's also a poem. And I think the reason that I would think of it as a poem is because part of what poems do is put pressure on language and context. And something that's really eerie to me about this is that uh, it is a useful reminder that a librarian, a person who taxonomizes information, gets to determine mm. the terms that we have to engage with in order to be able to find information. So if I'm interested in, let's say, doing research on colonialism mm -hmm. or um, mm. exploitation or um, extinction of population, of indigenous populations by white settlers, I have to look up the word explorers. And I have to be interpolated into language that, uh, makes systems of power um, invisible or opaque in order to be able to think about how structures of power work. Mm. And that invisibilizing gesture uh, feels really evident to me by someone decided that the word they wanted on this was explorers and they hand wrote it on there and they got to determine uh, what kind of language other people had to use in order to find the information they wanted. Mm. It's, it's a subject tab. It's not, so behind it, are all kinds of invented topical categorizations right. and classifications. Mm -hmm. And it may actually be following it dozens and dozens of cards, as Anna points out, it's only pulled out a little ways, mm -hmm. dozens and dozens of cards in which maybe explorers by name are reproduced, duplicated from the true alphabetical organization of the giant card catalog, and now they're doubly alphabetized under explorers, mm -hmm. so someone has decided that's an explorer, that's not an explorer, right? Yeah. So what an explorer is and what exploration is is something being determined inside a building. This was NYU, at NYU, mm -hmm. not at some place where you imagine exploration mm -hmm. had gotten done. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Poplar, uh, uh, your thought on this. Then we're going to invite whoever's on the phone to participate in this conversation. Then I have one more question about connecting this poem to Dickinson, weirdly enough. Dave Poplar, hi. Hi, how's it going? What's your thought? I know you. I don't know if you've looked this up on the syllabus. Yeah, I, I have. I love, I love right. uh, Erica Baum's work. And the thing I love about this poem in particular is the way that the explorers in the text are shoved to the back. They're, they're sort, of, sort of the afterthought. And it sort of calls attention to what we're doing, which we're exploring the text, the cataloging of these of these catalogs. I think I read somewhere about how, how meta it is and how this consciously draws our attention to our cataloging of the cataloging we do of language. Right. So this just represents so many levels of how we are exploring text and exploring knowledge to a greater extent. Mm. Thank you, Dave. Um, let's invite whoever's on the phone who probably has their own question, but we're going to hijack that to stay on this topic. Um, who is it, Chris? Al, this is Coco calling from New Bern, North Carolina. Great. First time caller. <laughs> Hi, Coco. Hey, Al. How are you? I'm great. Coco, I meant, I meant to pick up the conversation we were having about MFA programs. I'm a little behind in responding to your latest responses to that. Uh, I thought maybe I got just one response from you, and then I was on my own. Um, no, I'm with you. I'm still with you. I'm just a little behind because you responded. We were yeah, talking about... No problem. No problem. Wait, Coco's, yeah, Anthony and I have been carrying on. Carrying on. Yeah, so. oh, Coco, just to clue everybody else into this private conversation. It's not private. It's on the forums, but, you know. Uh, there's so much going on. Um, Coco Mensch wondered why in some one of the videos I said something bad about MFA programs, I think. What, you? <laughs> no, you didn't say something bad. Um, it's just, it, w it, was a, it was left hanging at the end of the discussion about uh, when you said, you know, just tell me one complaint. And the second person to respond said, there t it was uh, the discussion about um, yeah, Susan Howell's mind really different. Okay, and so you had left the question, uh, just some complaints, and somebody said, too many MFA programs, and then went on to say that uh, University of Pennsylvania does not have one, and it all sounded and good, never and will. I thought, well, wait, I need to know more. 
Thank uh, you. Yes. So. Thanks for clarifying that. Yes. So, but the implication was we don't want to have an MFA program, and so Coco naturally asked why, and we've had this conversation. So join us there uh, in that in that thread and talk about it. Um, Coco, we're in the middle of talking about um, Erica Baum's uh, card catalog. Can you hang on while we continue to do that, and maybe you'll have a thought on it? We're talking about yes. a card catalog piece, a poem photograph that is called Explorers and features an image of a card catalog with a tab that says Explorers. What I'd like to do now is read Emily Dickinson's Volcanoes Be in Sicily and ask a few people to respond to it. So it'll be um, Jason, uh, Erica, uh, Max, and Lily to respond to that. And then um, Coco and Tracy might also have a response after that. So here's, here's Emily Dickinson. My question is, what does this have to do with, with uh, card catalogs, explorers? Volcanoes be in Sicily. Volcanoes be in Sicily and South America. I judge from my geography, volcanoes nearer here. A lava step at any time am I inclined to climb. A crater. I may contemplate Vesuvius at home. All right. Who did I ask first to say something about that? I can't remember. Was it Amber Rose? No. I don't no. think she was included in the she list. She wasn't at even all. included. <laughs> the one person Jason. I included. Ja Jason yeah, I and Erica. Me. Jason? <laughs> um, I mark off everybody speaking before, then, then I, they all look marked off. <laughs> and that's inside the. Modpo Studio. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that strikes me about the photograph is also the bulk of cards that we can't see in front of explorers, and um, and there will be there is a generational divide between those who have the tactile memory of going through a card catalog and coming across unusual things mm -hmm. um, and those discovering dis discovering like you flip through the cards and come across a card that throws you in a new direction I um, remember my third grade librarian teacher mentor saying Go to the library and explore the card catalog. Well, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, but so I'm trying to think about linking it to that particular poem that there is in that um, Kind of tight compression of cards, um, a sense of almost uh, pressure and and tightness and packedness, out of which anything might emerge. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I also my my favorite work of the week is uh, Erica Baum's a, a Long Dress, which... Um, the new piece that's in The there, new yeah. piece, which, which I highly recommend everyone check out, which also, I mean, I, am I correct that this was the end of the card catalog for NYU, or this... Oh, this... When you're back to card catalog, yeah, yeah, yeah they were going to get rid of it, right? So, um, there's also in a long dress the use of um, here kind of domestic materials that also have a kind of um, the very texture of the paper has memory of um, the making, the domestic making of clothing, 
which Emily Dickinson m most likely participated in. Um, but what I would say is, is that there's the, 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 the card catalog is, I, I think it's important to think with what Davy said about um, the the kind of uh, curation of knowledge against the because in a way there's a need for a curation of knowledge and who is in in charge of that but that the card catalog in a library is a place of total potential mm -hmm. um, through the card catalog we can travel to Vesuvius we can travel anywhere and exactly. that packedness of the cards is almost indicative of and like with the explorers pushed to the back it's like they're about to kind of there's a feeling like you want to grab them and and pull one out and mm -hmm. see what's there yeah thank you jason um let's turn to erica your thought uh, especially on the relation between what is dickinsonian about this card catalog explorers volcanoes be in sicily any thoughts erica yeah, I mean, immediately the line from the Dickinson that stuck out to me that I think is really in conversation with Erica Baum's piece is I judge from my geography. Yes. So there's there's this sense that, you know, um, you gain experience, you gain information through things like travel, which we know that Dickinson did not do. Mm -hmm. um, but there are these other ways of getting information and there are these other ways of exposing language that one might not think that they have access to and it's through making work like what erica baum does where each piece you get different pieces of language exposed to the viewer slash reader and with dickinson i think that in this poem the language continues to complicate itself and create a changing portrait as you move through the lines of the poem. Uh, that's wonderful, thank you, Erica. Um, Lily, you have a thought about this? I think I did ask you. You did. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I agree with Erica. I also really pick up on the my geography, I judge from my geography, and then I also think, um, I'm thinking about indexing and the, the way of a card catalog obviously being an index and, um, this presumption that like the the card catalog can contain everything that needs to belong in the index or something versus I think Dickinson is maybe positing like uh, there's there's no end to what could possibly be in the card catalog and mm -hmm. so if you reorient where the where the base of the index is to your subjective person like your geography um, suddenly there's a lot, like an infinite amount that could be filed there yeah. versus card catalog, you know, it is it is a finite, it's limited by what books are published and what the library has in the collection or et cetera. So like, I think Erica Baum's like inviting us to think about what's filed here and why in a similar way to mm -hmm. Dickinson saying like, what would be like, you know, how much more can you gain access to if you use your own self as the basis of that index? Fantastic. Um, I want to hear from Max, and we'll go to Coco and Tracy. Really interested in that last line, Vesuvius at home. Uh, there's an obvious representation of counterintuitive power there, and I guess I wonder if Erica Baum, if Baum is thinking about the power of that one can derive, even if it's a resistant relation to the card catalog from such a search, not, you know, getting on your 
putting on your uh, your explorer clothes and your pith helmet and going out somewhere, but actually hanging around knowledge as classified indoors in a card catalog. Um, Max, and then we'll turn to Coco, who no doubt called for other reasons, but uh, we'll <laughs> think about what she wants and to say. And then Tracy, Max, your thought quickly. Can, can you hear me? Is this coming through okay? Yeah, now? you're good. Okay, great, because I know we had an issue earlier. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, it's interesting to pair the Dickinson um, with this piece in particular. Also, I guess to think about what's Dickinsonian about all of um, the, uh, the the pieces, or, or just more broadly, like the conceptual trend that we're exploring this week. Um, and I'm thinking in the way that like a lot of uh, these conceptual works um, and uh, this one in particular are kind of resisting the, the digitalization, the digitization of the archive or um, and or the rise of the internet as an exploratory tool for conducting research and gaining knowledge. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting in that respect that like we would, you know, we could also from our computers at home explore Vesuvius, but I think we would probably be more hesitant to say that there's something Dickinsonian about the internet, right? That that there's something about this archival research of like digging into the archive that feels more um, Dickinsonian for us, or feels to be more part of this kind of intellectual uh, journey across vast distances and time that we we undertake uh, when we're um, you know sort of arm deep in a card catalog, uh, flipping through um, the, the cards, seeing all the entries, uh, making associations, all these are, are sort of our brain firing with each potential uh, 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 route we could pursue right through through the archive, through the library. Um, that feels a little bit different from the internet, which is more uh, it's it's more diffuse. It's decentralized. Things are very instantaneous. There isn't that same kind of of work. Um, I think that it's perhaps an oversimplification, but maybe something to think about. Thank you, Max. Uh, Coco, you still with us? Yes, I'm right here. What do you think of all this? I know you called for another reason, but what do you think? What's happening here? I um, I felt like the card catalog. Poem. I've never seen that before. There are a lot of things in my photo that I've never seen. Um, and I, I, that is so delightful. It's really a, uh, looking at that was um, such a pleasant experience from all the years of reading card catalogs and then getting lost in them, just like in dictionaries and encyclopedias, which we don't even use anymore. Um, and so it was it, seeing the, the sequence of what Erica Baum chose to uh, to present was like a journey, and for yes. me it was a journey. It was a, it was it was a lot of fun, and so um, it, it does. It, I don't know where I was going with that, um, but anyway, the the word explore that exploration just you know that popped out because I was, and then the fact that it's kind of in the back of the picture, you know, the way she has that. Uh, the way she photographed that, um, it, it looks, um, you know, you kind of have to peek back in there at it. Yeah. yeah. You have to peek back in there at it, and it just makes me want to go back a little further and grab things. Yeah. I always wanted to pull the card out and keep it, but, you know, they're, they're yeah. were, they were in there with that rod. Um, and so, anyway, it, it, it does, I, I don't have a parallel with Emily Dickinson's poem. I haven't yeah. really given it. Well, you've made you've reminded us, Coco, that it is a meta poem. This uh, this one page in card catalogs, the book, is a meta poem because it's about what it's about the exploration that Erica Baum thinks is involved in poetry, and also you're yeah, having a kind of about. you're having a kind of personal memory of what your fingers and your hands and maybe your arms do or did in dealing with that, doing that kind of exploration, and also. Tracy, the, as we turn to you, what's interesting here is that the depth is reversed. So if it's in the back of the photo, it turns out to be at the top of the poem. <laughs> right? Right? So if it were closer to us, it would be at the end of the poem because we read the poem down from... Anyway, what are your thoughts, Tracy, about all this? 
Well, um, just extemporaneously. Uh, I really like the conversation between the two. I'm gonna start with the first line, which is, I don't have the poem. Yeah. Uh, volcanoes, what is Be it? Be in Sicily. Be in Sicily, yeah. right? And um, so what, is, what does that comment, volcanoes be in Sicily, and I'm thinking about it like sort of the way that I know be African-American vernacular, right? Vol volcanoes be in Sicily and South America. And to me it's, it's saying in col collaboration with Erica, there was already something there before somebody else got there. <laughs> so what does it mean to explore something and act like you the first person to be there? You're not the first person to be there. And for other cultures, volcanoes are people, mm. you know, and mountains are people. So it's like something existed, a force, a primordial force that people knew, noted, was there before somebody decided that they were going to call themselves an explorer. I also think that the Baum poem is showing the flawed aspect of even that articulation. There's two things I'm noticing here. One is that that it is harder to read the X, <laughs> and it's, it's like framing the unknown, but partly it's because it's been <laughs> thumbed down. So that means that somebody had to put their thumb on their, on their way to something else, mm. that, the, that the actual card is too high for the place that, it con <laughs> that contains it, or that in some ways there is a slow flattening of uh, explorer ah. that somebody else <laughs> like, is moving on to something else. It's so good. It used to be. It used to be like a fresh. So at one point somebody was freshly exploring this, but now everybody's been there. And but it still says explorers. Right. <laughs> and maybe maybe at a certain point it will meet its timely demise yeah. and just totally lay flat. And then something else that is sticking up that maybe we should see will be there. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah. I just think it's interesting in this poem, the, the volcanoes be in Sicily, that there's this juxtaposition with Sicily and South America. So it's like so-called old world and so-called new world. Mm. And um, th there's this also, also this notion of judgment that I'm seeing here. And then why not mountains? Because there's lava and lava flows and destroys things. Yeah. So one could look at the explorer as something, someone or some idea that destroys other ideas. Or one could say that the explorer itself in this catalog is being destroyed. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy Morris. Coco, I think we're gonna have to defer the question you were gonna ask. Um, maybe you'll call for final words. What's, so can you tell us what Modpo has been like for you? How, how's it been? What, what, do you, what do you think of all yeah. this? I, I think actually it was, it, I can sum it up by saying, first of all, I couldn't understand many years ago how to, how to even begin to approach Emily Dickinson. Yeah. So I feel a lot better about that. This is my third uh, trip around Modpo uh, that I, I, I was uh, just lurking earlier. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the, the second thing is that in listening to Tracy Morris's poem, you know, and I, I and I was like, oh, there's no there's no written version for me to look at. So it was it was purely an audi auditory experience. And that hearing that, I just realized where we come from the beginning of of in, with Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman to now, and 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 seeing that it's not about the words so much as the, the sounds, like the, the, the sounds in Tracy Morris's poem are, are, are more effective than, than the words mm. that she's saying. Wow. And, um, and then I thought when I heard it, I've got to see that, I've got to see that. So that was an amazing experience. I, I felt like I, I was like, I feel like I'm going to cry or lose control or something. It was just really powerful and it said so much to me and then listening to uh, the video with um, Nasser Hussein made me realize and, and, and with his constraints that he made with his um, sky, uh, sky, sky writing yeah. um, that made me realize that what, what you've got the importance of simplicity and mm. how, how making that constraint and all the others that, of poets who make constraints 
in this uh, these few weeks. That creates a simplicity that is that allows for complexity. Coco, and yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That, that was that just sums it all. That just brings it all around for me. So you, there you go. You did such a beautiful job here. It is week ten. You did such a beautiful job of summarizing the course and and describing where we've come. And rather than feeling that contemporary poetry, as so many people do, is a decline from the great old days, you're not only celebrating what we're doing now, and specifically what Tracy is doing now, but you're moved by it, and that's very yeah. exciting. And very. As a bonus, yeah. you got to you got to hang out with Tracy, who you know, who basically her work ends the course. Um, you're the second caller today, and so you're going to get a gift from us. Did you know that? Oh wow! Yeah, I, that's awesome. I, I, you know, three years ago, I, I watched the final words, and I hadn't even seen most of the whole course. And I watched the final words and thought, well, I don't really know what's going on, but I can tell it's important. Well, <laughs> gas up the car and drive up from North Carolina, Coco. I'm sure you have nothing better to do. Um, but in any case, in the meantime, give Chris your mailing address, and we have a copy of John Keane's book, Annotations, which is very similar, as he admitted, he was here last year, um, or proudly admitted, the, the, uh, my life, Linda Ginian's My Life, is a great influence on this book in the way it's organized passage by passage and sentence by sentence. It's a really great book, right, Anna, Lily? Mm -hmm. Amazing. So we'll send this to you, and thank you for calling, Coco, and have a great day. Thank you, y'all, too. All right. Thanks. Thanks for your kind words and the huge fan of John Hi. Keens. Mm -hmm. Six Hi one oh, Yeah, bye. 610-616-3208. I think I'd like to read... Um, I'd like to read Nasser Hussein's poem for Walt Whitman and ask um, ask uh, Did you Amber want to Rose. Hear some, like tweets and stuff first. Yeah. Okay. Let's do yeah. that. Let's do that. Yep. So here's some tweets. Um, there's a lot of love for Tracy in the Twitter. Oh. A lot some of folks. examples, please. A lot of folks Thank wanting to so know much. where else they can hear about your recent doings and events and goings on. So. Um, Wendy Make sure at the end we we yeah. do a little of that we'll plugging. Do a little. Yep. You know. Um, let's see. Um, Wendy Toole writes poetry and indexing, two of my favorite difficult things coming together this evening. Mm -hmm. um, Colleen Knight is really excited that you're here. She's a big fan of your work. We love Colleen. Oh, thank you. Um, Alana Shaw writes, we, hashtag ModPo Live, people are close reading and close listening explorers, discovering between letters and spaces. Love Erica Baum's card catalogs. Um, Wes Freeman, another first time mob poet, rookie of the year, um, is wondering uh, specifically what uh, what Tracy you feel like you can do in poetry that you can't do in music. Mm. So maybe that's a question we can come back to. Let's remember it. Yeah, it's Great. a good one. Really good one. Great. Uh, what I'd like to do is ask Jason to give MC the mic. Sorry, MC. And I'm going to read uh, Nasser Hussein's For Walter Whitman and get some responses, starting with Amber Rose. Um, now, remember, he only could use words that were three-letter airport codes. So he was limited to that vocabulary. And here's For Walter Whitman. Me, M-E-E -E is an airport. I don't know where. Anybody know where M-E-E is? Who wants to look that up? <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> me, me. Me, me. Bar, bar, ick, yop. Me, me, me. Me, me. Me, me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Amber Rose, then Davey, then MC, and we'll see where we go from there. How's that a what kind of response <laughs> Response to Walt Whitman is that? Is that supposed to be barbaric? Yeah. Barbaric yeah. Bar, what? bar, yep. ick, yop. Yop. Did anybody look up the airport code? It's in Me? New Caledonia. The airport in New Caledonia. You know, Nasser... What does yop mean? Y-O-P. Barbaric does it mean yop. something? It was, well, I sound yelp like barbaric in yop over the rooftop. Oh, yelp. Oh, yelp. No, oh uh, okay. Y-A-W-P. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yes. My barbaric yop. Okay, I yelp. see. Yeah. Yelp. Um, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, okay. I feel like I'm in, I feel like this, 
okay. Anyway. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting poem. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's definitely supposed to be pretty funny. Um, and I think we think of Walt Whitman or the way that Walt Whitman is discussed is like, you know, making, po- okay, the I is the we and we're all together and it's including everyone and he's like, you know, democratizing language and democratizing poetry and he was supposed to bring so many people in. But in a lot of ways, Walt Whitman was super self-interested um, and did not make a lot of space, like made a lot of space for himself to feel <laughs> really grand about making space for everyone else more than he was actually doing that sometimes. Um, and so this poem is just like really, really rubbing that in, uh, <laughs> really rubbing that in. Thank you. Davey, thoughts on this? And then MC. Yeah, and I think, I think that that's 100% right and that's, a legacy that we have to really reckon with in Mod Poe because we really want to set him, like one of the ways that we've talked about the Whitmanian Dickinsonian division is that one is really public facing and one is really private facing and that there's something inherently more um, capacious of other people about the public facingness. Mm -hmm. And this reading of Whitman challenges us to think about what's capacious about Emily Dickinson's privacy? In what way Mm -hmm. can a form of privacy be capacious of others? And I think that this is, Ambrose, I think you're 100% right. And I love Nasser Hussein's reading of Whitman uh, because it allows us to um, uh, think a little bit more carefully about Whitman and also about the Whitmanians in the course. There are a lot of, um, in most cases, uh, white cis men uh, who we teach in Modpo who are in a Whitmanian tradition uh, thinking about making space for others uh, in a way that's not especially capacious. I'm going to put Frank O'Hara in this category. And um, this pivots us back to Dickinson and to find an amazing capaciousness in a solidarity of privacy, which is kind of what's happening in Modpo. We're having a collective experience that's often very private. We are far apart from each other. We are often, uh, Modpo folks are often um, isolated in one way or another, though um, in some cases yes and in some cases no, and finding um, a way of being together while being apart. And um, that's something that the contrast to this is able to remember. And we're still kind of on the topic of exploration. This, this webcast is having like a holistic thing about it because when Nas wrote this poem, he kept thinking what I'd really like to do is get a grant and f- get some money to fly to, to fly the poems, right? So you'd go to New Caledonia, and then I don't know what BAR is, but then you'd have to go there, and then you'd have to fly, you'd fly them basically, in the po- and in the book, they're maps, mm-hmm. right? Yep. But Nas admitted freely that in most cases, he wouldn't make it very far, despite mm-hmm. his uh, perfectly uh, acceptable, from a Western point of view, uh, passport, Canadian. Uh, it, the, with the name Nasser Hussein, there would be inevitably lots of delays, right? While they mm-hmm. check him out or whatever. And so he knew that he could not possibly travel these poems. And the, his exploration into Whitmanian extensiveness and, you know, passage to Indianness would actually wind up being limited to the airport codes. You know, it's a pretty powerful statement about where we get to go. It's very Dickinsonian in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, MC, <laughs> hi, you have a mic. First of all, we love you and we're so appreciative of all the work that you've done oh. as a citizen of oh. Modpo. Oh, thank you very much. Of Modpo land, of Modpoville. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, it's a little surreal being here because for seven years I was just looking at everyone <laughs> <laughs> on a computer screen. We look the same, don't we? Oh, yeah, better. <laughs> better. Hey. That's the right answer. Between that and the cookies. <laughs> can I ask, before you comment on NOS, or you could comment on anything, actually, you've got the mic. Um, what's, so what's the difference? I mean, what... Hmm. Modpo, seven years you're with us. It's really not different. We're the same as you imagined, right? We're, you know, in real time is not what it's cracked up to be. I know it's fun to see you, but it's it was good enough, wasn't it, before you met us? Uh, yeah, but of course, it's always nice to connect human being to human being, right. you know. Um, yeah, and we can, and, and the biscotti, <laughs> uh, that's real, like, Very helpful. not not virtual biscotti. Yeah. <laughs> But it's uh, just been a fabulous experience. Um, and I've made a lot of friends over the years. Uh, 
So, and I like working at a computer because I can just sit and think I'm not an extemporaneous speaker. Well, you so. are now. <laughs> so it's literally live and happening. Um, will you have any thoughts about this crazy airport code project? Uh, I don't know. I just sort of had a visual image when you were reading the poem of um, things passing, you know, when you've, you, you're taking off on the airplane and when you look out the window, things are going by very quickly. Yeah, me, it's, me, me. Yeah. So um, mm. I just sort of had that feeling when you read yeah. it. Um, well, thank you for making the trip to <laughs> see us. Um, we have thank someone you. on the phone, and what we're going to do is something weird. Andrew, uh, can you get Andrew the mic? He's right over here. Okay, we're going to do something weird. Andrew, your job is going to be to take the caller's question or comment and somehow, even if it's not about Tracy, translate it into a question for your colleague <laughs> Tracy or a way for Tracy to comment on what it passing through you as a medium. That's fun. I like this idea. Okay, <laughs> let's find out do that. Who, is, who is on the phone. We have Diane calling from Washington State. Oh, oh. Diane, hi. Hi. Diane, is it Diane Knox? It is. So, Diane, we're going to see you in Seattle? Yes, I can't wait. Oh, but, yeah. that's exciting. We should, um, I think Anna's going to be in touch with you maybe about some possible venues for our meetup. So I'm going to announce oh. something really fun. We haven't asked Ray Armentrout this yet, but Ray lives in Seattle, and Ray has enrolled like just anybody. I'd <laughs> like to come to the meetup, to the ModPo meetup. Wow. Uh, yeah. So now we're thinking... If Ray has recently, and you're going to be there, so maybe we can get you to join us, David? Yeah. Okay. So, Ray, so Ray's in Seattle, and I'm guessing that Ray has, in the last couple of years of living in Seattle, written some poems that have a little bit of Seattle in them. You know how Ray writes these poems. There's always something that like she overheard. There's got to be a Seattle-ishness about her recent poems. So we find a Seattle-ish poem, and... Ray will be there, and we'll talk about it with Ray in Seattle. What do you think? That's pretty cool. Sounds great. And Diane, you'll be there. <coughs> I will. Fantastic. So do you have a comment or question? What's going to happen here is that Andrew, whom we're just meeting, although he's a neighbor of mine, is going to translate it into something for Tracy to respond to. Well, I'm a Tracy groupie, <laughs> but I, uh, I can't uh, find your schedule, and I... I want to know where you are <laughs> and what is new with you, and uh, oh, wow. I just think you're the fantastic. Uh, Andrew, there's no need to translate that, so we're going to let you do the next one because I think that there's no ne no medium necessary. <laughs> Tracy, you want to say what you're working on and where you can be seen? Uh, I don't. I mean, I don't know where I can be seen. Uh, just <laughs> seeing me on the screen is embarrassing enough. Um, <laughs> I am not on social media. At all. At all. Yeah. Um, There's some snaps. My, I'm very, I'm a very reluctant website updater of my own website. Um, I've noticed. <laughs> thank you for noticing. That's like, why thank she's you so Diane's asking a polite question, which is, when the fuck are you going to update the website so I can find <laughs> I, you, you know, giving performances I, and stuff? Yeah, I'm really bad about it. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's very flattering for people to be interested in what I'm doing. Uh, and I, I do appreciate that. But I, f I, I kind of feel, you know, the capaciousness of my desire to be pri private might mm -hmm. mirror Emily Dickinson's. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm a public, I mean, I perform a lot live, but I don't, I'm not really invested in saying, come see me, me, me. So I'm you're just not on the road, basically, in that sense. I mean, I go on the road, but I don't, I don't advertise it. I just, I'm just, I can't, you know, I, it puts me in a space yeah. that I just don't want to be in, which is always be closing, even though I do like that play and I do like that, 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 sh that, that movie. But I just can't do that because yeah. it would mean that I would have to not do other things. And I know that's not helpful, but what I can say is that I do write books. And so far I've written seven. And the, the, one of them is in its second expanded edition, which is basically twice the size of the first one, which is Hoodoo with Words. Um, the hand-holding book will also go into a second expanded edition, and it'll, it'll be two to three times longer than the original. 
So I, I, I write books so that people can find me in print. And then when people are nice enough to ask me to come do things, I leave it to them to decide if they want to let folks know. And, and it's not like, I just want to say, I, I do really appreciate your interest in, in finding out what I'm up to. Um, so it's not, it's not for lack of appreciation of that. It's just in order for me to be open to do other stuff, I realize I can't really do that well too. Mm -hmm. I, I just, just to be honest, maybe that just means I need to get a publicist. Can I, um, can I, well, it sounds like Diane is ready to be your publicist. Um, <laughs> what, uh, can, I, can I just say that uh, in this context, and I know this context well, it's just such a great honor and privilege that when we, Writer's House, Mod Po, you, you know, you've been with us on and off for years, when we ask you to do something that is not characteristically something you love to do, which is to get on the plane, it's cold in November, and come here and spend the day with us, and then go right back, we re it, it's an honor that you would put aside the capaciousness of your privacy, <laughs> which is a Dickinsonian paradox, and join us. So well, I'm thanks. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm happy just, to come out here. Of course. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, know, I, I don't mind I'm going to see people. I just, it's the advertising of it and okay. constantly. You know what? I have to one say, say one other thing. Yeah. The social media stuff makes me more averse to like say what I'm doing. Because it's like everybody say what they're doing all the time. Right. And also, lazy part, you know, people say, I follow you on social media. I say, I'm not on social media. They say, yeah, but everybody else is. So they just tell me. So I'm like, I don't have to do you it. You might as well be on social media. <laughs> I don't media. have to do it. Oh, yeah, so other funny. people do it. But anyway, that's that's not really an answer to your question. But I'm just that's saying why I'm, not, why I'm not doing um, it as much. Well, then, I, I think what we can say then is that you will be in Seattle, and that will be on your social, our, our social media. Well... If I, hey, I'm down to come to Seattle. Seattle's a great place. It is. It's got a great bookstore. Diane Knox, good, good would you stay on the, the line? Portland. I have an idea about what we're going to do next. Are you okay staying on the line? <laughs> I will. Okay, I'm going to play so like um, 45 <laughs> seconds of Slave Show to Video, aka Black but Beautiful, which I believe Amber Rose Johnson was in on a poem talk yeah. about yeah. that, right? So maybe you'd be. A, a commentator, but I would love for Andrew to comment since he's got the mic on what you're about to hear, right? Okay, and then I'm going to ask um, Erica uh, and Anna to say a little something about Erica it. Erica had we'll to go at four. Sorry. Oh, Erica left. Yeah, okay, Erica, so um, uh, Gabe and Anna to just comment a little bit. So, R Chris, are we ready for this? Erica. Yes. Bye, okay. Erica. Okay. <laughs> Ain't she beautiful? She too black. She too beautiful. Bo I think, beautiful. Yeah, she too black. Ain't she? Ain't she be, be beautiful? Ain't she? She ain't beautiful. She too black. Too too beautiful. Too 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 beautiful. She ain't. Ain't she? She ain't. Ain't she? She ain't. Is she? Ain't she beautiful? She, she too black. Too beautiful. Ain't she? She ain't. She ain't. Ain't she? Ain't she too black? Too beautiful. Too bo beautiful. Bo beautiful. Bo beautiful. Full booty. Too black. Ain't she beautiful? She ain't. She ain't. She she ain't beautiful. She too. Black, too beautiful, ain't she? She ain't she ain't ain't she too 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 black. Ain't ain't she beautiful? Ain't she beautiful? But beautiful, she too black. Ain't ain't she beautiful? She ain't beautiful. She too black. Ain't she beautiful? She ain't ain't she. Okay, rudely, I'm gonna skip forward, and I apologize. Too beautiful, but too black. Ain't too beautiful, ain't she? She she ain't too beautiful, but too black. She beautiful, but too beautiful, but too beautiful, but too beautiful black. Too beautiful, too beautiful, too beautiful, but too beautiful black. Ain't too beautiful. She ain't beautiful, she ain't beautiful, but too black. She ain't beautiful, but, but too, but, but, but too, but too beautiful, but too black. She ain't she, but too black. She ain't beautiful, but, but too black. She ain't too beautiful, but black, beautiful, but black, beautiful, but too black. Ain't she beautiful? She ain't beautiful, she ain't beautiful, she ain't she, ain't she, she ain't she, ain't she, she ain't she, she ain't she, she she ain't she, she ain't she, she she ain't she, she ain't she, she 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 black. Ain't she beautiful? She ain't beautiful, she ain't she, she she ain't she, she black. Ain't beautiful, she ain't she, she ain't she, she, she ain't she, she black, she ain't beautiful, ain't beautiful, she ain't beautiful, but ain't she black, but black and beautiful and book full booty and but boot and full booty and full booty and book full 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 booty and and boot full full beautiful book beautiful and book and black. Tracy Morris. Oh wow, okay. Um Amber Rose, uh Gabe, Andrew, and Diane. In that order. So, Ambrose, thoughts quickly? 
I, I'm just like grinning. I love this poem so much. Um, I mean, I'm thinking a lot about um, simultaneity um, and what it means to try to say something simultaneously out of one body and with one voice um, and the challenge of doing that. And, and so there's this kind of doubleness that we're hearing in the voice that's trying to perform the doubleness of black women occupying both this like um, sort of position of being seen as super eroticized, uh, but also really hated and despised as be seeing, uh, being seen as sort of an icon of beauty and also like the complete underbelly of beauty. Um, and there's so much uh, there's so much that's being communicated in the mode of the performance that um, exceeds just what the words themselves are doing. Um, yeah. Beautiful, Ambrose. Thank you, Gabe. Your thought on this? Uh, well, I'm struggling because I think Amber Rose is so right. And it's such a good poem. And I don't have a lot to say. Oh my God, it's so dark in my house. Um, let's see. <laughs> Chicago is dark early there. What, ha what happened over yeah. there, man? Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, no, I mean, I think, I think that comment on Final Fantasy is very good because it's just like this poem really condenses so much into a phrase. And I think that's what we've been talking about, like really manipulating language so that a lot can kind of come out of it. Its implications can come out in a certain way. And I feel what uh, Tracy's so good at in poems like this one and poems like The Mrs. Dancer Ass Kicked or in Chain Gang is like getting implication out from just the explicit components of the language that's right there just really pulls out a lot. Mm. Mm. Beautifully put. Andrew, what are your thoughts about yeah. this? Uh, I'd like to ask a question, Miss Tracy. Yes, uh, Mr. Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is about uh, longevity partly because of what your responses to the caller was and partly just listening to your voice, which I've heard for many years. I met you 15 years ago and uh, you know, you'd already been, been at this for, for more than a minute and here we are 15 years later. And <laughs> yeah, how do you, how does longevity live in your body and your, your voice? Wow, that's such a great and appreciated question because like we're people, we're not just objects that make up art that people could just listen to or look at, right? And I should ask you the same thing about Headlong and, and your work. Uh, I, I sort of pay attention to stuff that I used to not pay attention to. And, and sort of, I'm so grateful to be alive, <laughs> to like have a body and to have a body that works, you know? And I stop judging it as much. Mm. <laughs> and that really actually helps. And I start to notice things like, okay, what happens when I do this versus that? And as you know, being on the road a lot, you really have to do pay you really do have to pay attention to how your body responds to certain things and respect it in order to do work. So as I've gotten older and been like on the road a lot, I have moments where I'm just like so heavily on the road, and then recovering you know, what does that mean? What am I supposed to do? What's reparative or whatever? And I think this like, go, 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 you know, pretending that the body is a machine that's carrying your head around, that mm -hmm. does not last. And it doesn't make wow. you a, a good artist at a certain point. So you've got to kind of respect that. And I've had to do that over the years. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, wow, I'm amazed by that answer. Um, Diane, are you there? I am. Do you like to take a crack at this? Uh, you, heard, you, I guess you heard the video, the audio, fairly well. What do you think? I, I this you is feel? just incredible. And Tracy, you are too beautiful, oh. too beautiful for words, and your words are too beautiful. Oh, well, thank you, my goodness. I just stay here. Diane, it's <laughs> really kind of you. Thank get you. Get on a plane and don't go to me, 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 but come to Phil. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank, thank you for calling. We're going to see you in Seattle. Yes. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Thank All you. Right. What I want to do, kind of in lieu of final words, but these will be final words, and everybody's going to get a crack, but it's got, everybody's got to be quick, and Claire, our onlyest intern, is also going to have a <laughs> shot at this. Everybody. So what I'm going to do, this is a time, this is literally a day, because I couldn't keep myself from listening to, at least through the radio, to the hearings that are starting, the impeachment only the third time, and really the second time. Uh, no, third time. Um, 
we're going to listen to Yacht Blanc perform what the president will say and do, which we've <laughs> talked about before. But I think this is really a good day to talk about. And we've been talking about sound, and we have Tracy Morris here. And so what I'd like to do is play it and invite everybody. We'll go around to everybody. And your final words will be a response in some askew way or some direct way to what Yacht Blanc is saying about what presidents say and do. So here is Yacht Blanc. Thank you for uh, this conference um, seance in uh, CalArts in Los Angeles. And uh, I met this uh, writer, Madeline Ginz. You're saying you met Madeline like Ginz at a seance. A short meditation of, on the title of one of her books. What the president will say and do. 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 What the president will say and d. What the president will say hmm 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 d. by the applause at the end. <laughs> yeah, we were amazed. I was sitting there. I'm the one who went, whoo, like that. <laughs> Seriously, I was sitting over by the old Taj Mahal watching someone try to record it. It was so interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Davey first, followed by Max. Something that's always so striking to me about that recording uh, and about the poem is the way that it equates both articulation and articulate articulateness with capacity and uh, that it basically uses a um, disfigurement of the voice as a stand-in for commentary on capacity. And that's something that I always find interesting and always want to put a little bit more pressure on. Uh, and I wonder if um, we might do that in our comments of thinking about how uh, the futility of governing structures uh, is represented by uh, maybe ableist uh, relationship to being, uh, to having the um, capacity of articulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Davy. Great way to start this. Max, your thought on this? Final word? I'm struck by the Blanc's choice to, to turn this into these, this grunting, extremely forceful language that sounds like it's taking a bit of a toll on his uh, on his diaphragm, since we were, we were talking, well, Tracy was talking about that earlier, right? The um, uh, prompted by Gabe uh, talking about the breath. I'm just saying that that was the that's the direction, rather than, than maybe getting quieter or all the other choices mm -hmm. he may have had um, with this poem to, to make a, a similar point. And I think it's it really uh, calls our attention to the to how this poem is about speech acts right um what the president will say and do and, he, and he's getting he's over the course of the work the, the performance the speech really becomes this physical uh act uh, or, or it's the physicality of the speech act is is very much in our face thank you max lily next and then jason i'm thinking a lot um about how many of the works in this week um have different elements of humor, elements of play, and elements of experimentation, and the different ways those work together to kind of like create or make tone complicated. And like I always hear this piece as very scary, like a very dark tone. But then sometimes you hear people laughing in the recording. And so I'm just kind of interested in how conceptualism plus, um, I liked how you said that earlier, as like a movement. Um, walks an interesting line with humor, 
play experimentation to create like a tone you might or might not expect or give you like a bodily reaction you might or might not expect because I was also here when in the room when Yap performed and I would say the range of emotional reactions to his various pieces like ran a fascinating gambit from like laugh out loud crying laughing reactions to like that literally physically backing away um, because his expressions were seemed to be going out of control you know so very interested in how all this is born out of like a quote unquote restraint or um, um, stricture sometimes imposed by conceptualism. Thank you, Lily. Jason, final thought on this? Um, probably in the private quarters of the White House, we are hearing <laughs> similar sounds <laughs> um, throughout the day. Um, but um, what's interesting to me among many other things, is the way in which the, uh, for Yap Blanc, the poem has a kind of built-in decay. Mm. And um, in terms of its uh, duration, it's like we, we realize what's happening. And 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 I I still want to talk about Tracy Morris's poems f for like for three years, mm -hmm. um, but what Tracy's uh, poems do for me at least is different than that because the Up Blanc is is unidirectional and Tracy's poems create for me a kind of, because we were talking about the sentence, and there's no way to know where the poem is going to end. Um, and there's this kind of, it creates this amazing tension between never wanting the poem to end and being really curious about which, where it will end. Thank you, Jason. That was lovely. Um, I want to turn to Gabe and then Julia Block. I don't know how long you've been sitting there. Oh, we, well, I want Julia to grab the mic because we're doing final words and it, final thoughts for the webcast. And we just listened to Yacht Blanc talk about what the president will say and do. I love that poem. Yeah, and so I thought you might want to say hello and also comment Aww. on that. But first, let's go to Gabe. Gabe, what do you think? Yeah, I actually, funny enough, have a, I think, a very related comment to Lily's, um, which is I, I would really invite us to think more about tone uh, and maybe mood in all of the conceptualist work of this week. Uh, well, once I asked the op blanc when he read at the writer's house, like, how do you think about the moods you construct in your sound pieces without semantic content? And he was like, I don't. <laughs> and I, um, you can do that what you will, um, but I don't believe him um, uh, because there is such palpable moods in the work that he makes. But the thing, the thing that's hard about mood and that's hard about tone with artwork is that you don't know where it lives you don't know if it lives in the art or in you if you're reacting to it or if it's, it's somewhere between you and the artwork so it, it's something that i think we should think about further and just as a a recommendation um before you go is an amazing poem by charles bernstein it's my favorite poem of his and it's uh it's really beautiful but it, it thinks about a lot of these things i think uh in kind of subtle ways thank you gabe julia block Hello. Hello. Hi, Let, Hi, the Let the record show. Let the record show, and many people will know this. Uh, those of us who've been involved in Modpo for a long time, including Mandana and MC, many people at this table. Julia helped us create Modpo. Was the lead coordinator TA for several years, and is really fundamental to the way this thing works. And look, they're bringing the lights up on you. Aww. Aww. Up. Julia, welcome home. Thank welcome you back. So much. Thank you so much. Do you have I just came in from the cold to catch yeah. the tail end of the webcast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love what Gabe just said, and it just makes me think of um, a lot of things, including this conversation I just had with Sarah Dowling that we're hoping to have a life somewhere in print. We were both talking about how we both have 
books coming out that use found language and we talked about how language is always in conversation even if you think you're plucking it out of thin air and that's what, and we ta actually in fact talked a lot about tone and how the tonalities of a text that you may have appropriated from mm -hmm. someone else's mouth or someone else's page has tonalities that you get to discover and the reader gets to discover along with you. Thank you, Julia. Good to Breezing see you. in with that amazing yeah, really, like, <laughs> Breezing what, back out. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, so I'd like to turn to Claire. Uh, we have to get a mic to Claire. Uh, and then Dave Poplar for final thoughts or anything about what the president will say and do. Yeah, um, I've actually been thinking a lot with this week's poems about an archive and like what is an archive, especially with card catalogs. Mm. And Tracy, what you said about the body and longevity and like the body as an archive. So I think hearing this poem and hearing it build upon itself, I thought about speech as an archive. Um, I don't know, I, that's just been going through my mind and I guess it's like breaking those constraints about like what the archival process is and whether it's different or just the same thing, adding and adding and adding. So that's just kind of what was going through my brain when I heard Thank that. Thank you, Claire. And by the way, as our first and onlyest Modpo <laughs> intern, which we're going to do again next year, yeah? Yeah. Um, say briefly what you're doing. I know you're working on mm -hmm. curricula. You're creating lesson plans. Yes. For what age, what kind of student? Um, roughly like secondary, middle school, high school. I'm a secondary education English major. So basically, I'm trying to help translate Modpo into more accessible um, learning processes for someone who's like 13 to 18 mm -hmm. um, and something that can be really worked into a classroom and in like in a group setting and more creative processes for poets. And we're grateful to you. We've been um, getting those. Anne and I have been getting weekly updates of these lesson plans. And who knew they were so organized? There's a whole oh. format thank for you. lessons <laughs> plans. Yeah. So thank you, thank you Claire. That's cool. um, so let's turn to Dave Poplar, followed by Anna. Uh, just a brief comment. I was trying to think about uh, this poem in light of you know, the current impeachment hearings as you introduced it. Uh, I find it really interesting that the language as it's used in this poem, it doesn't just degrade, it becomes meaningless as language. It becomes uh, you know, absolutely uh, without reference, just it means nothing. And it almost seems like that's where we're at now with these impeachment hearings. It's almost irrelevant what was actually said. We're talking about what happened on this one call, but the way we've come to interpret it, different sides of the, of the aisle, uh, it almost loses the reference. It's almost irrelevant about what was said, and we're just talking about the arguments themselves anymore. So it's almost like this poem is an extreme example of what's literally going on mm. right now. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Um, Anna, final thought? Um, I am thinking about the first time that I ever heard this poem performed. Um, and I think he's he's writing about President Bush, right? No, it's actually Nixon. Oh, it's Nixon? I mean, oh, well, when I, I should clarify. When he was at the seance with Madeline Ginz, <laughs> Madeline Ginz wrote a book called What the President right, Will Say or Do. Nixon. That was a response to Nixon. So there is a kind of symmetry here. Yeah. Mm. Well, when I first encountered it, then I was thinking about both Presidents Bush and their various esophageal malfunctions. Um, and hearing it at a time uh, that was really different than this particular time, um, my reading of it, I'm, I'm like reminded also of Lily's comment about tone and Gabe's comment about tone, that there was something like scary funny about it. And now it's just scary. Right, like there's, there's, there was something about the Bush's ineptitude that, even though it caused like tremendous harm and tremendous violence, um, seemed like somehow less precarious than it is right now. Um, and I, I just, I really feel like that that listening to the to this performance right now, what I hear most is like struggle and violence and. Um, like tremendous uh, pain, really. Um, so yeah, I wish I could follow up um, Gabe's question about like what do you, how, what do you think about how do you think about tone? Because um, I, I really do want to think more about that. And it seems it seems impossible that tone's not a consideration. Mm. Thank you, Anna. We're going to turn to Jess and Amber Rose, 
then Tracy, and then I'll have a couple of announcements to close out. Um, Jess, final thought? Sure. Um, so many great things have already been said. Um, that recording was startling to hear, and um, I really appreciated what Davey said um, about capacity. And I was thinking about that um, as everyone else was uh, was was speaking, and and I and it, and it made me realize that part of my part of what I was feeling as I listened to the recording was a kind of uh, like retreat or a kind of uh, not like a violent recoiling, but a sort of like shrinking into exhaustion or something. Mm -hmm. Like I felt startled, but also very tired, I think by the end of it. And, you know, that made me think about the very thing that Davey suggested, you know, we should think, we should put pressure on, which is to say like um, the presumption that like, I don't know, a kind of critical act or a critical statement, you know, is joined with some kind of normative. Oh, I'm so from sorry. Lee. <laughs> is joined with some kind of normative capacity, whether for, yeah, speech or, or like, or listening or resistance or, or really anything. And and my my recognition of like exhaustion, kind of made me made me think of that. And hearing that for the first time is the first time I listened to it. Full Yikes. disclosure. Yikes. <laughs> Yikes, I know. Yikes. I know. Wow. Poor me. Should have warned you. No, uh, thank you, Jess. Amber Rose. Amber Rose Johnson. The amazing Amber Rose Johnson. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, Tone. Um, I want to give a shout out to Ken Hay, um, who wrote a really phenomenal essay. And this essay is on my mind for essay three on O'Hara because we were talking about Walt Whitman and how we deal with that legacy and Davy brought up O'Hara and um, for essay three we're talking about personal poem by Frank O'Hara and a lot of the essays were sort of recounting the like New York school style and that there are a lot of funny things in the poem um, but Ken did this really really in incredible close reading where he's talking about this like strange underbelly this strange tone that he couldn't quite figure out and he brings up the two lines in the poem where O'Hara mentions Miles Davis being clubbed by a police officer. And I hadn't seen anyone else comment on those particular two lines in the poem. And they were really, they made me really uncomfortable actually, um, reading and sort of trying to engage with giving feedback on the essays. But there was this like violence, this police violence against a black man that, that we weren't accounting for in the class, in our conversations, in the essays. And it was really unsettling to me, this sort of, what that was doing to the tone um, and how this like violence against a black person was sort of the foundation on which O'Hara was having this otherwise like jovial experience of being on break. Um, and yeah, I think there are a lot of poems like that where there's this sort of, this this tonal underbelly that we don't always get to engage with. And Ken did a really great job. And it was inspiring for me to see him sort of take that leap, even if he couldn't articulate what it was that was unsettling for him. Um, so all that to say that tonal shifts are something that we can sort of feel in our bodies, mm -hmm. even if we don't know why, mm -hmm. and it's worth it to linger with what's unsettling. There could be something really important happening there. Thank you, Amber Rose. Tracy Morris, mm -hmm. final thoughts, but this is an opportunity for us all to say thank you for joining us oh, today. Not pleasure. just here. <laughs> Tracy Morris. Thank you. Guys. We're so grateful to you for hanging out with us. And you got two special guests because Andrew came and hung out. And too. Andrew yeah. too. <laughs> well, you know, I actually did comment about this a while ago because you invited me to talk about it with a, an early poem talk, very early poem talk. Mm. I don't remember what I said back then. Mm. What we I talked about this? Yeah, yeah we talked about this. It. This is the first time I heard Yap. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's a couple of interesting things. One is that Yap has a notation systems that he uses. Um, so the, the, that's distinct, um, it, you know, sort of complementary to our practices in working with sound. There's not like that many sound poets. So, uh, you know, I love the opportunity to think about what he's doing. Um, 
what the sound poet will say and do. Uh, and and I and I and I like the you know I feel like we're you know colleagues in this particular subset of poetry. There's probably like four people, but anyway. Uh, and one of the things that I think is interest, interesting in this poem is the way he interjects the line. He's not breaking that line down. He's interjecting with a whole other kind of sound. And then it overwhelms mm -hmm. the official speak. So when you said that comment about, you know, this is probably what's going on, less artistically, I compulsively said also. But it's like, how is it interjecting with, the, with a particular sort of tone that we expect from these hallowed halls? There's someone saying what the president will say and do, and then there's some other sound that absolutely has nothing to do with the construction of our democracy as we know it mm -hmm. through the statement. And, and I just wonder, especially because we're talking about Nixon, you know, Nixon said that famous line, if the president does it, it isn't illegal, right? Mm -hmm. So what the president will say and do is a speech act in this sort of flagrant disregard of a constitutional democracy mm -hmm. versus whatever the, fee the, the, the utterance of a fiefdom is. And that's the interjection, I think, of that, you know, that conversation that, that Yap is also talking about. And you know, there's a, since Yap is a European, you know, he has references for like pre-democratic Europe also, which is you know, feudal systems. So I just think it's a super interesting and you know, sort of different way of approaching sound poetry that I really appreciate. And yeah. this is not just extemporaneous because he has notation systems, yeah. yeah, that he thinks through these things very carefully. Yeah, mm. he does. Thank you again, Trace, for that comment and everything else, including a session we had this afternoon which was not recorded but which was very great, deep, thoughtful. Oh, I have a final thought on this and then I want to just thank people and announce a plug next week. I just wanted to point out what was implicit in Jess's and others' comments here after listening to Blanc, which is that so many of the, cha of the week 10, chapter 9.3, poems, especially when we get into Mod Pop Plus, they're essentially political poems. And so mm -hmm. a lot of people think, oh, you know, the conceptualism is, way it just doesn't have anything to say. But, and they're really deeply political, whether it's a strat strategy like N plus seven in Rosemary Waldrop's hands, where she rewrites the Declaration of Independence using this kind of constraining, but also somewhat arbitrary, but also deterministic method. We holler these trysts to be self-exiled, that all manatees are created equidistant, that they are endured by their creditor, not creator, with cervical, unanswerable rims, et cetera. You know, what a, what a way to challenge and, and, mm. and um, uh, disorient us toward, to the Declaration of Independence. Or when Mike McGee comes in as a flarfist and, and sort of sounds his way through the Pledge of Allegiance to the point where it degrades, I planned a neat myth, today's rags, ugly unified fates never heard of you and 10 and 3 colonies or 50 nifty states coronation underground un into mythical palabricity and just this for all or indeed it all started when we were brought here as slaves from africa deeply political poem obviously but as as much uh, as a sound poem um Several of us have been rereading Terence Dupre's book on the survivor. It's called The Survivor. And one of the points he makes is relevant in this case. It's a little dramatic to think about genocide in relation to impeachment and what a president can say or do, but what the heck. Um, so in this book, Dupre argues something counterintuitive, that silence, which is often a response to life in extremity or trauma, a reasonable response for some people, Silence, you can't find the words at all, so you remain silent. Your voice has been taken away from you. Silence is one response. Of course, silence equals death, so silence is not optimal in any sense, but it can happen. Where to put the scream in relation to science? silence? The scream is often also a way of um, expressing that you don't know what to say, that you can't say, that you can't find the words, so you scream. Normally what you do is you put articulate, organize bearing witness and testimony on the positive construction side, 
constructive side of this ledger and you put scream and silence over on the wow, it's, it, it, there's nothing that can be done and things are bad. What Dupre argues, and I'm persuaded by it, and I'm reminded of some of the work of Yacht Blanc and Tracy Morris and others, is that the scream is actually closer to giving testimony. That the scream is a way of saying, the words are falling apart, but I still have a voice and I'm going to make noise. It's going to be agonized noise, it's going to not make that much sense, but it's going to be a human voice reaching out vocally through the you know, organic mechanisms that we have to make noise to refuse silence. Scream is closer to testimony than it is to silence. Language has consequences, right? And we have a president who sort of is very blissfully ignorant of the fact that language has con that words have consequences. All right, I want to thank a bunch of people. John Stark for g trying to get into the Arizona Poetry Center, but for f finding Maud Poe instead. Clarissa from calling for calling from Australia. Coco from North Carolina. Diane Knox from Seattle. Um, MC for showing up today, first time. I hope you'll come back a lot. Pam, Mandana, Andrew, what a nice surprise. Emily, fan of Modpo, fan of Tracy. Claire, our onlyest. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything. Lily, Jess, hi. Thank you. Hi. Amber Rose, <laughs> Anna, Davey. Max, I think Gabe's still there in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> Gabe, Jason, Julia Block, and Chris and Zach. Holy Yay. cow. <laughs> oh, my. And Tracy Morris, once again, thank you for joining us. This thank was lots of fun. So we'll be back on Monday. Monday, so that'll be kind of like week 11. Um, Monday at 10.30 a.m. Philly time. Final words, please drive here, fly here, train here. And if you can't, Call us, and we will send out also a voicemail phone number so you can leave a voicemail final word. So and thank we'll you. And we're going to have lunch. If you come, you can have lunch on us. So <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Jason, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> thank you all. Bye-bye. Scotty, -bye. Scotty.